guys, we are back to talk about some more goodies from Genesis 11. So um, we were starting on verse 26. I should say we ended there. We're going to start there. But before we completely leave um, the genealogy of Shem, I wanted to throw this out there because I think it's quite significant. If you remember before the flood, when we have Genesis 6, we have all the names of the 10 generations, and they come out to basically um, the testimony of Jesus, right? It gives the born, well, anyway, the whole story. Go back and watch that one. It talks about, right, the son comes, he dies, he brings us salvation. All right, he's going to bring us rest. Um, now, if you take the first letter of each of the names in Shims, which would be Chapter 11, verse 9, no, 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 verse 10 through 25, we take the first letter of each name, we get a message. Mark Belt shared this several years ago, and I have it in my notes and thought it would be significant and important to share with us as well, um, with you guys. And it says, I will forgive my enemies, showing compassion, forgiving those of the dust a second time. How awesome is that? First coming, second coming of Jesus, right? We have the flood and Tower of Babel. We have two different events, yet the Lord is still going to forgive us. And I think that's so great because if you ever have the feeling of, well, I've blown it, it's done forever. It's not. Literally, the Lord is prepared, arms open for us to just acknowledge our sin, repent, and return to Him. We are of the dust, right? Adam was made of the dust, but made in the likeness of the Lord. Then he lost it at the fall. We're still made of dust. We're not in a renewed, um, glorified form yet. But through Jesus' death and resurrection, we accept him. We're moving from the dust, man of the dust, into the glorified form, which is what we want. And we only get there because we have been forgiven, because we've repented and become a part of his body. Anyway, there's my long round circle. Does that make sense, long round circle? No, that doesn't. But despite that, let's move on. Okay, we're now going to look at the genealogy. I'm looking at verse 27. It says, and this is the genealogy of Terah. Terah brought forth Adam, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran brought forth Lot. So just like we have with Noah, who brought forth three sons, we have Terah bringing forth three sons. Now, we don't know exactly the age of, for Noah, it was Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We know that Japheth is older than Shem. So it's very possible that the order in which these three are born, just like Noah's sons, are a matter of, well, importance, significance to the story bringing forth Messiah, which would mean Abraham is the most important in this story. And it's true because from Terah, we're literally moving into Abraham's story. If you think about that later, we're going to see that with Jacob, Jacob's son, and it'll say Jacob's generations. And then it'll talk about Joseph because that part of the story is so significant to point to Jesus. So here we have, we're not really sure if Abraham is the oldest, if he's the youngest, if he's the middle. The point is, he is significant as far as the story goes. So let's go to verse 28. And Haran died before the father, uh, excuse me, before his father, Terah, in the land of his birth in Ur uh, Kazdim. And Abraham and Nor, uh, excuse me, Nahor took wives, and the name of Abraham's, or Abram's, excuse me, <laughs> wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Yiska. And Sarah was barren. She had no child. Uh, no child. Okay, we're going to stop there. We're going to talk about that. There is the thought that, well, let's look at this. It says that Nahor died in, the, in Ur, which also means fire. It is also a place. Now think about this. You know, we talked about everyone listed in this genealogy was alive, except for maybe Pele, was alive during the time of the Tower of Babel. So everyone knows this, and yet we have Abram and his family who are actually in the area of Babel. They're actually in, this area is the area that we would have Babylon in. So I find that interesting. I mean, he's already had, okay, hold on. 
We know around 50 years old is how old Abraham or Abram was during the Tower of Babel. So here we have this age and then around 50, he's still in, he's still there. I mean, was his family gone and come back? We don't know, but we do know that his dad, Terah, did, according to Joshua 24, 2, did worship idols, did create idols. He was a maker of idols. And the rumor is, or the story is, that he made them for Nimrod. Now, in the fire, it's very possible that not just in Ur Chaldeem, but meaning in the fire, meaning Nahor died in a fire. You know when they have, oh, excuse me, in Daniel, when um, the three who get thrown into the fire, and suddenly I'm having a complete blank. Um, what are the three? Oh my gosh. Um, they have, no. Um, Oh my gosh, okay, whatever, we'll get to that later. But their names I can't think of. But the three, they get thrown into the fire, all right? And they don't burn. And before they go in, they say, hey, whether our Lord preserves us through the fire or we die in the fire, it doesn't matter. We refuse to bow to Nebuchadnezzar, okay, or to the statue. So um, here's an interesting little, little bit, tidbit. It is said that Abraham... Abram, excuse me, that Abram was thrown into the fire and the Lord saved him. Because remember, we had mentioned that he probably went with Shem and studied with Shem at some point after, or maybe even before. He could have been with Shem when the Tower of Babel happened. That's very possible. If he was, it makes even more sense why when he returns to where his dad is, that there would be even more sense of, look, there's one God and look, we have evidence of what the Lord did by stirring everyone's language. I mean, how can you argue with that? And then, as we said, the story that he sets up, he being Abram, sets up the false idols and blames the one for killing them and, and killing, you know, or um, crushing them. And, and his dad's like, well, that's silly, right? Okay, so here's the thought that because of that and understanding that Abram understood that there was a living God in his study with Shem, that Nimrod had said, you know what? You bow to me. You bow to me because of what you've done. And I'll let you live. Or else I'll throw you in the fire. And Abraham refused. Abram, excuse me. Abram refused to bow. So he put him in the fire. And lo and behold, he lived. He didn't die. So, from that, Nahor came to say, I trust the living God. I trust, I totally trust who, who you have. And, and Haran. And I apologize, I said Nahor, but I mean Haran. And Haran was like, I trust that God. So he gets thrown in the fire, but he doesn't live, which is why when the three who are thrown into the fire say whether our God survive, uh, saves us, like in Abram, or we die like Haran, it doesn't matter. We still live and we still serve the living God. That's kind of a cool thought, huh? Again, that's a midrash. It's, it's not right here in the Bible, but it's often taken with the understanding that Haran died in the fire before his father's eyes. His dad literally watched his son die because his son refused to bow down to Nimrod. And notice, it says because of that death of Haran, then we have where the two brothers, in verse 29, uh, Abram and Nahor took wives, the names of their wives, one was Sarai and the other is Milka, uh, Milka which is the daughter of Haran. So, this is a great thing to honor their brother's name who died. They took his daughters as wife. We know that Milcah is. We know that Lot is the son of Haran. But what do we do about Sarah? It is said that Sarah is actually Ishka. But she becomes, uh, not Sarah, but Sarah, yeah, Sarai. She would be Sarai. She gets Sarah later, yeah. So Sarai is actually another name for uh, Ishka, which means that both the brothers, Abram and Nahor, married the two daughters of their brother. So they married their nieces. By marrying their nieces, now think about this. Sarai is only 10 years younger than Abraham. That's all. So that tells me who the oldest brother is. I immediately go, well then, wow, that would probably mean that um, 
Haran is probably the oldest. Now, if we go back and look at the pattern of the sons of Noah, who was listed Shem, and then Ham, and then Japheth, and we know Japheth is older, he's probably the oldest. It would line up to be the same pattern in the order of age as well as importance that is listed. I just find that kind of incredible. You also want to look at Ham is kind of the, he's the middle one and he's really the one that doesn't do much good. Well, here we have Nahor who really isn't, I mean, yeah, he's not the best of them. Meaning, if it's true, Haran died for the living God and Abram lives for the living God. Okay, remember we have uh, Shem living for the living God and Japheth is going to be honored because he has the multitude that are going to dwell with Shem in the tent, right? We know that from Genesis uh, 9. Okay, so moving on, we've got where Abram has taken a wife, probably a daughter, and we have um, Nahor taken a wife. They do this to honor the name of their brother, all right, they're doing it out of honor and to protect and take care. Now, the way that happens is with Sarah, Sarai, it doesn't say this with Milka, but it looks like Tara, Abram's father, adopts and brings them in as his own, that he adopts Sarai. We have these patterns again later on with Jacob when he adopts Joseph's children. So it looks like that may be why Abram is able to say, oh, she's my sister of the same father, but different mother. Because the father is the one who adopts her once the son has um, died. That also, to me, says, ooh, is it possibly the oldest? And that's also why he's adopting. I don't know. Just something to think about. There's a lot going on in these verses. So let's go down to verse 30. It says, And Sarai was barren. And she had no child. Obviously, that's going to be quite important. And Terah took his son, Abram, and his grandson, Lot, all right, and, uh, excuse me, son, Aharon, and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, his son, Abram's wife. And they went out from there, to, uh, excuse me, from ur Kazdim to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. Okay, I don't get why they leave and they move to an area that's called and named after his son. So I immediately just wonder, did they really go to a place that already had that name? Or when they moved there and settled, they named it after the son? And then it just became known as that. So that's why they write it. That's why it's listed here. To show out of honor when they moved to this area, they named that land after the son, out of respect of their brother and son who had died. I don't know. It's just a thought because I find it so interesting, you know, that, that that's like that. But anyway, so um, let's talk about this real quick. You know, it says that Tara took his son. He does not take Nahor. He only takes Abram, Abram's wife, and Lot. That's all he takes. And they leave. They flee. Well, I'd like to suggest this. I'd like to suggest that after the firing event, after Haran died, right, he grabs him and says, let's go. It says here that he took his son, like forcefully grabbed and took, drugged them out of town. Could you imagine your chief, one of your chief um, idol builders and his son has destroyed them all and then you try to kill his son and he doesn't die? Abram's just sitting there like, I don't know, mm, I serve the living God. What a challenge and threat that would be to Nimrod. He is trying to be the king of kings, right? The master of it all. And yet here is someone representing the God of Shem in his territory. And we've already had everything split, right? I mean, this cannot be more than 20, 25, well, let's say this, 18 to 25 years after the Tower of Babel, this is happening. That's not long after. Think about your life. Think about in 20 years what's happened. A lot, but I mean, wait a minute. It's not that far away, okay? It's not so far away that you don't have a clear memory. Here in the United States, we think about 9-11. I mean, that was 19 years ago from right now or 20 years ago from right now. 
it's still, well, if you were alive, it's still memory. I cannot imagine that anyone has forgotten about the Tower of Babel. This has happened. So to have a challenge from the God who did that, I'm sure did not delight Nimrod in any form or fashion. So they leave. Now, I've got to explain this to you, but I'm going to read the rest to verse 32, and then I'll finish this. It says, um, all right, let's see, uh, verse 32, and the days of Terah came to be 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, here we go. Terah is 205 years old when he dies. Now, we have two things happening two possibilities, and we don't know which one it is. In Acts um, 7, Acts 7 verse 4, it says that Abram was called out of Ur, Chaldean, not out of Haran. Haran is very far. It's, uh, let's see, it's northwest, moving northwest, following the, I think it's the Euphrates River. It's northwest of um, Israel. No, excuse me. It's northwest of Ur, where they, they lead the Babylon area. It's northwest of there. It's north of Israel. So that's where they go. But that's not where it says in Acts. That's not where it says he was called. Abram was called from Ur, Chaldean. He was called before that event. So let's kind of look at these two possibilities. One is, the Lord called him and said, you need to go. You need to leave your family. Go. And he, well, he lingers a little bit. Or, in the matter of him getting ready to go, his father grabbed a hold and said, no, you're coming with me, and took him up north. Stopping him somewhat from leaving like he was supposed to. Then it says in Acts that he left after his dad died. Well, his dad died at 250, excuse me, 205. But it says at age 70, in verse 26, he lived 70 years and then brought forth Abram. So we have one of two things that happen. In that 70 years, just like with Noah, I believe in Noah's 500 and Terah's 70, that those three children were born pretty much boom, boom, boom. Now, it doesn't mean, I don't mean one or two years apart, but I mean there's not 40 years between them either. Could be. But I tend to think that there's a little more significance, a little closer in age. Maybe from Abram to Haran, maybe there are um, 15 years or 20 years, but not, not 80 years, not huge years. I'd also like to say this. It's very possible that these aren't all of Tehran's children, but from the point in which Abram, these are the three that are significant for the story. Okay. So we don't know that these are only, these only three are his kids. So it is possible. So let me say this. If he was born around 70, then that would make Tara 145 years old when Abram is called out in chapter 12, when the Lord calls him to leave. But here is my proposal. One of two. One, either Abram is born much later much later, and Tara dies, okay, and he leaves, which would mean that they were only there for very few years before um, Abram left. That's possible. The second is the word that's used in the Greek in Acts can mean physical death, but it can also mean a spiritual death, okay? So, here's another possibility, that while Abraham or Abram was called out and his dad yanked him and pulled him and they left. He's called a second time and that time he leaves because he's testified and his father has refused. We're going to see in chapter 12 that many people left with Abram who followed the living God, who wanted to follow his example. So is it possible that once his father reached a physical no? But a spiritual, yes, a spiritual death, that that is when Abram left because there was no more hope for his, bro uh, his father. His father, I say no more hope. His father had said, no, thank you, I am not interested. And therefore, it was time for him, when called, to leave. I would suggest there's a possible second calling. 
Here's the other reason why I say that. We're going to run into this strange thing as we read through more of this, um, the first five books of the Old Testament, where there are times that we see the, the number of 400 and times that we see the number of 430 for Israel. That's from Abraham until when Israel comes into the land. We have 400 and 430. And no one's like, where, where do we get those numbers? I don't know, but here's something to think about. I've never heard this before, so bear with me. <laughs> I don't know if you can find it anywhere because I've never heard this. But here's a thought. If in Acts, Abram was called when he was still in Ur to leave and he didn't. All right. And then they go up to Haran with his dad. What if, here's the suggestion, what if they're only there for five years and then the Lord calls them again and at that point that he's called a second time, he says yes. The whole chapter of Acts 7 is all about second chances. It's about the first, it didn't happen, but the second will. It's about the first got close, but the second will succeed. The first time possibly Abram was called. He didn't make it. He went with his dad. The second time Abram's called, he is. The reason why I suggest possibly five years is if so, if at the age of 70 he was called, but he didn't leave until the age of 75, that's five years. If we do the 400 count, some say the 400 count from Isaac to when Israel returns. And some say it's 430 because it's from Abram, Abram, Abraham, Abram to Israel coming in. Both can be correct. If we see that the first time he was called, he was age 70. And then we have Isaac who's born at um, 25 years later. That would make third because you have five, then at 75, to 100, he's walking the land and he has Isaac, that equals 30 years. That might be the mystery of where the 30 years come from for the 400 from Isaac and the 430 from Abram. It's just a thought. I hope I didn't lose you in that math. I'll say it again really quickly. It's very possible that from the first time Abram was called until Israel enters and the birth of Isaac and Israel enters, that those two numbers 430 and 400 is where we're going to get the numbers that we'll see later and that they don't contradict they actually line up they're just from two different starting points okay well that ends our um chapter 11 discussion and i'll tell you what there is still a week's worth of discussion we could literally do but again my idea is just to go through and help us to be able to get through the scripture and make us want even more hunger for more so that this is something we read over and over continuously always allowing the Lord to show us and reveal to us who he is and the plan that he had not only for his people but for us today as well so thanks for spending time with me and I hope you have a great day bye